It has taken over 50 years to put into words, and after all that time, it takes only two. American Downhill. Oh, this is gonna be hot, he has nailed this course. We were the risk-addicted few, pioneering mountain descents at ever-increasing speeds on slopes far, far from home. Even today, downhill remains a European game mostly played on foreign snow. So, for some eight months out of the calendar year, our teammates became our best mates. And almost without knowing it, we've become a tribe. After all these years, it's been discovered that the American downhiller is much more than a brand, it's a bond. I mean, I think the, um, I think the concept of American downhill has always been there in the background. I don't think any of us really acknowledged it until, uh, or, or I don't think anybody acknowledged it sort of formally until Marco coined the American downhiller name. We always felt like we're different, you know, the guys that were on the downhill team. We always felt like we were different than the tech team. We always felt like we were different than the women's team. We always felt like we were different from any of the other men's teams in the world for lots of different reasons. And so we just, you know, felt like we had a unique bond, all of us. And, and we, we do. I mean, I can, you know, sit down and chat with downhillers from the 70s. And, you know, we've got a unique bond, even though we didn't know each other then. So we remember, you remember the downhills right down to the plain and snowflake. You always do. Downhill is, is, is sort of a unique deal. You know, they've been running Bengen for 85 years, so I can go talk to whoever who ran it that long ago, and does, you can talk about the same turns and the same experiences, and I think that's really special, and that's part of what brings us together as well. You know, we, we have experienced the same emotions, and it doesn't change a lot over the years. The discipline of speed sort of requires a different mentality and a different personality and that we're all sort of alike in that way. I think it allows the whole American downhiller movement and culture to evolve. I'd have to say like being a downhiller there's, there's definitely the, the fear. Like for me like when I raced I always like just thought that downhill was the coolest sport because you're like your own race car just watching racers like come over you know a big jump and catch tons of air and, and then back in their tub and it's kind of like cowboy like super dangerous high speed um, and it's usually the guy that kind of wants it the most that can take the race by the time Tommy Moe showed up at the 1994 Olympics he had fashioned himself into a Formula One but still with a hint of that freewheeling VW micro bus but going back to the beginning it's fair to say that when the US team first showed up in Europe it was with a fleet of high-powered American muscle cars, probably best suited for a demolition derby. Afraid of nothing, loving everything, and ready to put on a show. It wasn't about the paint and polish. That wasn't an option. It was about what was under the hood. Like downhill, there's more element, there's more like heart in it, and there's more like me mental strength where you have to go out, and even if your equipment's good, and you're really fit, you still have to like pull something from within yourself to like make yourself take those risks and throw it all out there. I've had 13 knee surgeries. I had nine knee surgeries by the age of 21. I would consider the American downhillers like the cult. You know, that's, I always had a picture of Bill Johnson. I said the slalom and GS are just events, downhill is a cult. The first time you show up in Europe and run a downhill, the rest of it becomes somewhat... <laughs> it was, that was not the focus anymore. Once I figured out what downhill was, I wanted to be a downhiller. Well, let's not forget, we're post-Vietnam, okay? So the whole country was sort of uh, uh, in anarchy, if you will. And it was, this, you know, late 60s, early 70s. So the whole country was rebelling in one way or another. And it was okay to have long hair or smoke pot, and that's what everybody was doing, not necessarily in the US ski team, but as a country as a whole. So now you have a combination of skiing really, really fast, you got long hair, people kind of dig that, and I wanted to be a part of it. We didn't even care. I mean, it was so fun. I was traveling around Europe with 15 of the craziest guys I knew. We were good downhillers, but we were pretty damn good partiers too. There was a certain element of 
being 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, above the law, rock star status, uh, and things that I suppose weren't necessarily okay. We would have these huge parties at the hotels we would stay, and then somebody came up with this idea of rookie night that then just became the most hilarious skit night every year that, I mean, it just, it got bigger and bigger every year. There were skits. If you were a rookie, which meant you had never run Kitzbühel before, they dressed you up, um, they fed you drinks, and it was a great night of camaraderie. You drove fast cars, you chased hot chicks, you had long hair, you tried to be the rock star of, of, of that era, and, and I mean, why do you think we did it? <laughs> What do you think you kept coming back after all those crashes? It was exciting. Everybody wanted to be a downhill. We didn't know what we didn't know until we got there. And then we knew. And we realized that it was probably better that we didn't know. You have to get exposed to racing in Europe. I mean, that's just what it boils down to. It's, it's a completely different culture over there than we have here. So Europe was just so much different than, than racing over here. Um, it's super competitive. The venues, the race venues are, are totally different than what we see here. You look at the Hanukkah, you look at the Laberhorn, you look at Mezhev, you look at Cortina. These are the real deal. I don't think we really believe that we belong there. And we went to Val d'Isere, the opening race in one particular year. And I looked over, and here's Erwin Stricker from the Italian team. He's got a helmet with a fairing. He's got bent ski poles. And he's got fairings from his knee down to you know, the back of his ski boots. And I looked at Carl Anderson, my roommate, and I said, we're fucked. <laughs> they had rubberized suits. I'm like, what's this? They have rubber suits? And I'm looking at me and I'm going, I can't beat that. So now we're at the, in the bathroom back at the hotel with hot water running out of the bathtub. And we're trying to bend these ski poles because we want to be like them. There's nothing smooth about racing in the 1980s in downhill. It was just mogul field and ice and snow changes every 30 feet. We have to remember in those days we didn't have any snow making. We had no um, grooming equipment. They did, you know, the grooming equipment was the army packing it. Wooden skis and leather boots and the release factor in the bindings was when the screws pulled out of the ski. We didn't have fences to keep us out of the trees. They might put up some hay bales, but very often you'd go right through the hay bales. So you had a good incentive to not go into the trees. The netting, there is no netting at Kitzbühel. When I ran Kitzbühel, it was wooden slat fence the entire way down. Well, one thing I can tell you is that the organizers put the US ski team in the worst possible hotels ever. We were 20 miles away, we ate with the, with the workers. And there was a, I won't call it a hatred, but a strong disliking to anything Euro. Franz Klammer called Bill Johnson a nosenbore, which means a nose picker, which really means a rookie. But Bill Johnson getting called a nose picker, it was fists up and he wanted to fight Klammer, that's for sure. They were the guys that were easy to hate. I mean, just because they were so good. Um, they were good, they were, they were robotic about it. They were methodical about it. They, you know, they had all the resources. It fueled, it fueled my desire to, to win. We started to have a little bit more success, feel a little more comfortable over in Europe, feel a little more comfortable on these courses. Um, like that athletic success turned into a little bit more team success and a, and a better atmosphere as a team. Traveling together, rooming together, eating together, sharing coaches, sharing physios, um, sharing resources. It's a family. I mean, you're over there, once you hit the road, you're on the road with everyone. Um, the difference is Europeans go home every weekend after each race, they head home, they see their wives, they see their families. We just create more of a brotherhood uh, because of our uh, being Americans and having to be in a European sport. Beyond the time the group spent on the road, in hotels, sitting at dinner tables, there was the unspoken connection, that undercurrent, that your next run or race could be the end of the ride. A conscious or not, every start was a risk. 
the, the day that Scott McCartney had a big wreck in Kitzbühel, he ran second, and I ran 15th that day. And this was the first year that they actually had like TV screens. All they really upgraded the start house in Kitzbühel. They had TV screens everywhere, and you could hear the announcers. And it was like we were warming up for the race. We were like plugged in to what was going on. So we Scott went. He crashed, and it was a you know amazing gnarly wreck. <laughs> like he goes slides to the finish line, and he's convulsing in the finish because when you have a big head injury, that's I guess a normal reaction is your body just kind of starts tweaking out, and they cut. TV coverage, and uh, we like, and I thought he was dead, and uh, I was like, okay, I got, I got a race still, um, and they held held the course for a while, and the other, all right, race is on, and anyway, I ran fifteenth, and. Um, I get on the course and I'm going over the mouse folly and I wasn't even thinking about anything. I was like thinking about Scott and um, I just had this like moment of clarity where it's like if I don't focus right now like I'm gonna be right next to him in the hospital, you know. Ended up having like my best kids feel ever. I ended up sixth place and um, I didn't, I just felt like this emptiness going through the finish. He was you know, one of his best buddies saw it on TV. You know, half hour later, 45 minutes later, he's getting in the start gate, blast down to fifth place, his best time ever at Kitzbühel. And uh, and then also after that, being able to uh, go to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> I I was up watching uh, McCartney's live. And I said, Kelly, I woke Kelly up and I said, I just saw someone die. I'm like, I just saw this guy die. And I don't know how he did. If you only started paying attention to the American downhillers over the last decade, you might think of the US as a powerhouse, fueled by speed legends like Bodie Miller and Darren Rawls. But it has been a process. On balance, it has been more struggle than success the occasional win or streak, followed by a plight of legendary crashes. Until 1984, the U.S. was going on 50 years without winning the Olympic downhill gold. And then came brash Billy Johnson to ignite everything in his path. Not everybody really liked Bill Johnson, um, but he was great to me. He was my biggest mentor. My first time I met Bill Johnson, I was at a training camp in Copper Mountain. And I knew Bill Johnson because he was the mean guy in the white downhill suit with ketchup stains all over it. And, but I hadn't really met him. And I had the flu and I went to see it, the, the team doctor. And when I went out, got out of the team doctor, I walked out the door and I heard this guy say, what's wrong, you sick, you little pussy? And I looked up and that was Bill Johnson. His impact on American ski racing is he paved the way for the guys, for the Darren and the Marco era. And those guys took it to a different level. I mean, they won a lot more races. But Bill Johnson started that. Americans can win. Bill Johnson probably would not have made it in another era. Not because he wasn't such a great skier, but because he had a, a personality and a, and a lifestyle that would not have fit under the, the Beatty rules. Bill Johnson was with us in the 80 Olympics as a forerunner. And I, you know, as coach, we got to pick our own forerunners. And he happened to be skiing on the same skis that Pete Patterson was skiing on. And we used him, and, and Pete got fifth, basically due to Bill Johnson's expertise in skiing down and down and, and helped us pick the right skis for him. I believe it was three things that made him so good was the aerodynamics, for sure, the risk of the line, and then his just absolute amazing ability to psych out the competition. He was just, a, he, was, he was a master at it. <laughs> Nothing like Johnson, I'll tell you. That kid, Jesus Christ, he was unbelievably tough. And he was, he's not alone. 
Those kids are tough as hell. As fast as Bill Johnson ascended, shortly after 1984, the U.S. men sped into a drought. There was no results to stand on for us, and that was tough. I started racing World Cup when I was 16 years old and totally got my ass kicked, like, for years when, you know, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. I had, had like, eight years before I even, like, had a top five. Jeff Olson, myself, we'd be down in the finish and nobody was in the top 30. Um, and then it just, we slowly build up those results. Uh, I had a top 15 in Kitzbühel, um, but then really the next year when AJ, when he won in Val d'Isere, um, that, was, that was a huge, huge breakthrough. You know, we, we would have good sections or we'd have good training runs and, and then on race day, we just couldn't put it together. Um, and then after a while, we'd have a good race. You know, you'd, you'd pop a top 10 or a top 15. And so we were growing from a good section to a good training run to a good race run to then, you know, just building consistency. Like in the early 90s, there was just like, we were all just not that good. And then all of a sudden, AJ Kitt won a World Cup downhill in Val d'Isere. And it was so cool because all of a sudden, we're like, wow, like AJ can do it. Like we can do it. I remember in, uh, in Ori, Sweden at the finals one year, I, uh, I popped in and got a fourth. And that was the first time in a really, really long time that anybody got a top five. And that was big for the guys because, you know, uh, on any given training day, any one of us American guys would, would beat the other guys. So it wasn't like I was always the fastest guy. I just had developed the ability to have some consistency. Kyle won in Bengen. I remember being in Europe and uh, going to some Europa Cup race and, you know, hearing on on the radio. You know, not really understand all the Swiss German that was going on, but Kyle Rasmussen, USA, you know, Seeger, all this stuff, you know what they're talking about. And that was just a huge moment. That was a big deal when, when Kyle won. The next decade was a slow build with the likes of AJ Kitt, Kyle Rasmussen, and the eruption of Tommy Moe. Tommy Moe is another one of my heroes. And Tommy Moe I watched as a little kid just grow up and all of a sudden kick everybody's ass and become badass within two years. It was amazing. And then the next thing I know, the guy wins a gold medal. Like I didn't really expect to win it, but I had a bunch of top threes before that. So I knew like if I can go out there and ski my best, then maybe I can score a medal. In the first two training runs, I didn't really do that well. I was like, you know, I was like 30th, and then maybe like in the 20s in the second run, and then the third run, I was like, this is it. I gotta, I gotta hit it this time. And I actually had a pretty good run, and I was fourth place. And then Andy Mills, he comes up and he's like, so Tommy Mo, do you think you can do it tomorrow? And yeah, there's a place down at the bottom. It's called, they call it Mo's Channel. And he just, he just came down, and that was my second. He came down and he executed. He just, perfect. I thought we were going to win. I, uh, when he went by me, I yelled, go Tommy. It was the loudest noise that ever came out of my mouth. I could barely talk for two weeks. When I stepped in the starting gate that day, it, you know, there was, when I watched the race even to this day, it's like everybody else had a little mistake and I didn't really have any mistakes. Somehow I, you know, I was like, 0.15 out in the first section and then in the middle there's this jump called the Rusi jump and I ended up pre-jumping it which I could never do probably ever again in my life but I made up like three tenths and then I lost a little time on the bottom and uh, beat the Norwegian favorite and you know Almat called me the wrecking ball because <laughs> it was like his race I mean he had a gold medal and when I came down right behind him I was bid eight like it was quiet when I came to the finish line I'm like what what happened and I looked on the board and I saw one I was like, oh my God, this is like unbelievable. I can't believe it. But even with the success of Tommy, AJ and Kyle, the American downhillers still struggled to establish themselves amongst the juggernauts of speed. The Holy Grail, the World Cup downhill title has remained just out of reach. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think we've ever been in a spot where we feel like we've dominated. In the years when Bodie and Darren were really, you know, at the top of their game, they were sharing podiums. That was probably the, 
the pinnacle of um, of what Americans can do in competing on a World Cup down down to her. I remember mentioning to Darren, hey man, if you ever win a World Cup, we'll throw a big party for you. And he looked at me and said, there's no if, I will win. And that next year, he won. I never denied Darren winning Kitzbühel. It's just, I mean, that's the big daddy of all. And, and I think winning Vengen for Darren and, and Bodhi is huge. Steven winning in Val Gardena. I think all of those are big events. I think winning titles is a big one. For me, like that would be a really like giant goal in my like big picture scene of things is, is for an American to bring home the downhill title. I know it's possible, I know it's capable I know we're capable. The guys are healthy and strong and I don't know if we've ever done it. Seeing Darren and Bodie push each other and, and on the hill in Portillo, them training, Darren would lay down this fast run and Bodie would be like, no, watch this. And he'd lay down on the faster run and then Darren would step it up again and Bodie and then Darren and, and those two, when they were just punch for punch on the World Cup week in and week out, that was really cool to be a part of. And now uh, having that American downhiller crew, uh, I'm, I'm the leader now. It's, it's pretty wild. I, I think the American downhill team has always had a lot of camaraderie and it's been just the fact that downhill is dangerous and it's a small group of guys. When you kind of go into the fire together like that, you know, it forms a brotherhood for sure. So there's always been this great camaraderie with the downhill team and now we are the American downhillers and we're taking moving forward with that. But uh, that's definitely not a new concept. When you say American Downhiller, I think right back to the first guys, you know, the Bill Johnsons and the you know, names I didn't even really know, but the history of it like definitely comes back a long ways.